Okay, guys. Uh, last but definitely not least, a little bit one of the uh, major element of this school is to uh, introduce to you. Well, it doesn't need to be much introduction, but you know, uh, one of our touring, our when I say our because you know this school is uh, is branded as an ACM school. And of course, I don't need to introduce Larry Lampard, otherwise we'll be here for the rest of the week. Um, and uh, it's probably better that I introduce the two students who accepted to prepare a number of questions and interview Leslie. Z those very few of you that were here last year, they will remember that we had uh, Leslie in person here and uh, we had a similar interview, which of course, you know, uh, would have been better to have Leslie here, but you know, for a number of reasons, he could not be with us, but you know, the, uh, today's technology is good enough to have, you know, virtual, virtual presence. So the two students are Maria, who is a student for her bachelor in, actually in artificial intelligence, I believe, and Ignacio already got his master, so we have two kind of uh, different level of expertise and uh, they will uh, entertain Leslie and Leslie will entertain us with about you know, one hour question and answer. So, well, Leslie, thanks a lot again to be with us, even if he, through, <laughs> through, uh, through internet. Uh, and okay, I would say we, we can just start. So I don't know which of you want to uh, start first. Thank you, Fabrizio, for the introduction. Thank you, Leslie, for being here. Uh, knowing that you studied a degree in mathematics, what about computer science attracted you that convinced you to move to that field? Well, uh, I had worked at programming uh, while studying math and uh, and at some point I had a choice between uh, well, uh, while studying, I started programming, but came to be doing what now might be would be called computer science. Uh, and uh, when I finished my degree, I had the choice of uh, going and teaching uh, uh, math or staying uh, with the company I was at and doing computer science. And I almost by accident, uh, decided to do computer science. Yeah, I think it was a very fortunate accident. <laughs> okay, so uh, next, I don't know who of you. Maria. Yeah, Maria. Also, could you explain to us how your experiences in mathematics have influenced your approach to your work in computer science? Well, my experience in programming made me want to do practical stuff. And my education in math taught me to think abstractly, which is uh, really essential for doing computer, good computer science. Or in fact, doing any kind of science, I suppose. We know that technology uh, changes rapidly. How do you, what, how do you, what dressers of methods do you recommend for continuous learning? Well, I can't really say that I have stayed uh, current. That's certainly not uh, in recent years. Uh, and, you know, actually throughout my career, my knowledge of computer science uh, was not uh, broad. Uh, I was interested in some topics and I got to know those pretty well, but uh, really didn't learn very much about parts of computer science that didn't interest me at the time. Okay, moving on to your work, what aspect of it are you most passionate about? Well, when I began, uh, my passion was concurrency, uh, mostly because well, the uh, 
the problems in concurrency just seem to be more fun uh, than you know, the other stuff around. Uh, and these days, uh, I spend you know spend my effort uh, trying to get uh, programmers to think before they code. Yeah, that is. Uh... A very appropriate uh, observation. So next, uh, looking back at your justice career, is there a particular project or achievement you are most proud of? Well, I don't really think of myself being proud of, of the things I've done. Uh, I guess they've always seemed very simple to me, and. Uh, I don't, a bit surprising that uh, other people didn't find them simple. Uh, yeah. But the thing that uh, I guess I've been fondest of, and perhaps it's because it's the, the first thing that I did, uh, but it's uh, been the bakery algorithm. And I guess uh, very just very recently, uh, I I realized that in uh, it was in 1976 uh, when I was studying proving correctness of, uh, of concurrent algorithms, uh, and that I realized that there were two different kinds of properties that. Uh, the uh, that one wanted to prove about programs uh, correctness properties. That is, uh, the, there were uh, I, I call them safety and liveness, and this was just pure intuition, uh, and it wasn't until uh, let's see, probably about eight years or so later that I realized what the precise mathematical definition of safety is. And then a year later, uh, people discovered uh, you know, Fred Schneider and, and his, his student uh, Alpern uh, figured out what the precise mathematical definition of liveness was. And it turned out that every property is the conjunction of a safety and aliveness property. And I really find it somewhat amazing that I, without any sort of mathematical uh, understanding, but just out of pure intuition, uh, I discovered those two uh, important characterizations of uh, correctness properties. Then, what is your thought process like when you approach a problem? Uh, well, you know, I can't explain uh, my thought process uh, any more than I can explain uh, how I walk uh, or talk. Uh, you know, it's not something I have any conscious awareness of. Uh, what uh, what might be of interest or useful to people is to is that uh, I've never worked on a problem uh, without first having some idea that I might be able to solve it, or you know some have how idea of how it uh, could be solved. Uh, I don't decide oh because problem is interesting, therefore, you know, I should uh, work on it uh, because, you know, I know I'm not smart enough to, you know, solve every problem in the universe. And so it's a lot easier just to work on those problems that I have some reason to believe that I can solve. So it's no teachable that your work on the Byzantine general problem had has a lasting impact. 
what motivated you to tackle this problem and how do you view its relevance today in the context of the modern distributed systems? Um, well, uh, I wrote a paper in 1976, or maybe it was 70, well, it was written in about 76 and 77, uh, called Time Clocks and the Ordering of Distributed, of Time Clocks and the Ordering of Events in a Distributed System. Some of you may have read it. Uh, and that had a, uh, well, it basically showed how you can uh, implement in, in principle any or solve any distributed synchronization problem uh, by basically implementing a state machine and gave an algorithm for doing that. But that algorithm uh, was not fault tolerant. And I realized you know, very quickly that to be really useful, it needed to be fault tolerant. And in those days, it wasn't clear you know, what kind of faults people should be worried about. So I just uh, decided that uh, I should uh, solve, be able to, to solve that problem in the face of an arbitrary failure. And at the same time, uh, people at SRI were working on the full tolerance system for uh, basically flying airplanes. And uh, yeah, I discovered this when I went to work for uh, uh, did I say, I forget that, did I say SRI? I meant to say SRI, I don't know if I did. At any rate, I went to work uh, at SRI and you know discovered that those people had uh, approaching the same problem, but they had a different way of solving it. And, uh, you know, that's how the, uh, well, that's how the problem and the first paper and the solutions appeared. Uh, the, uh, the name Byzantine Generals uh, came out, was, wasn't attached until uh, the second paper. Uh, and, that happened because I figured that it was an important enough problem that it deserved a catchy name. And I eventually came up with the Byzantine generals problem. Yeah, for the, the people who don't know, SRI is the Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park, so in the middle of the Silicon Valley, just off the Stanford campus. And has always been uh, you know, a kernel of uh, you know, very, very smart computer scientist. Also, uh, well, I was going to say it stopped being Stanford Research Institute by the time I got there and it was just called SRI. And, and its connections with Stanford were cut. Okay, carry on. Also, you are the creator of LaTeX. So, what was your vision when you started developing it, and how do you feel about its evolution and current usage? Well, uh, I don't know if I had a, a vision. I, uh, I was uh, going to write a book, and uh, the, uh, decided I was going to use tech, and I realized that I would have to write bunch of macros uh, in order to typeset my book. And then I figured that the little bit of extra work, I could make them generally useful. And so that's how LaTeX came about. Uh, the, uh, maybe it was a, turned out to be a little bit more work than I had anticipated, but not an awful lot. And I think I spent maybe about six months on it. Uh, I can't say that I'm terribly happy with its uh, uh, current uh, 
recent developments. Um, but it's come to look like most software. Um, I was just talking to my colleague, Fred Schneider, about it, and you know, he was complaining that, you know, you know, I use LaTeX, you know, there were all these things that it could do, but it was really hard to figure out, you know, how to do them, and uh, uh, it was just very frustrating. And I asked him, well, was that true, the, you know, when you started using, you know, the original LaTeX? Uh, and he said, oh, no, you know, for that, uh, you could just read my book and it explained everything. Uh, but what he was talking about, all of the uh, other packages that have been developed that have been quite, you know, that are useful. And I've used a couple of them, although uh, very few of the uh, Recent packages, and uh, the um, basically seems like uh, the uh, LaTeX uh, has come to look like most software, meaning that the documentation is terrible. Uh, and uh, I know one thing is that it's. The typical of, of well, Unix software is that people make changes to it and don't care much whether that breaks uh, you know, current users. So uh, I can't say I'm that happy with its development. So now we are starting a section about TLA Plus. For someone that has never listened about it, how would you explain it to him? What inspired you to, to create it? And how did your experience with earlier formal methods influence its design? Well, you know, TLA plus uh, is a language for really thinking mathematically about programs. Uh, the uh, well, the way it came about was that. Uh, well, I should. It's, I said I created uh, LaTeX uh, to as I was writing a book, and the book was about concurrent algorithms, and I stopped writing it because uh, you know I thought I understood how to write correctness proofs, you know, how to reason about concurrent algorithms. And I could do a great job of it at the whiteboard. But uh, when it came down to writing it, writing it down in a book, I realized that it was just not really completely rigorous. And uh, so I couldn't write the book, so I just stopped. And a few years later, I discovered uh, a form of logic that I invented a form of logic that I call TLA stands for the temporal logic of actions uh, that had the ability uh, to represent an algorithm as a mathematical formula you know not a bunch of mathematical formulas but as a single mathematical formula and I realized that that made it uh, that everything I wanted to do, I could then do perfectly rigorously. And uh, so I decided that uh, having the logic, I should invent language that uh, a complete language that could uh, be, uh, you know, that one could write, uh, that we could actually, in practice, write down a description of an algorithm or a design of a program or something like that, uh, mathematically, completely rigorously, and, and basically simply, in the sense that 
uh, it was as simple uh, as mathematically possible, since that uh, I had been developing ideas for how to reason, to think about, and reason about concurrent systems uh, over the years, and this was the simplest. You know, I figured as about as simple as uh, as one could make as, as one could make a mathematical description of these uh, of these things, and so I wanted to embody that into a completely formal uh, language, and that was TLA plus. Okay, over the years. How has TLA Plus evolved, and what do you see as the next steps in its development? Are there any features or improvements that you are particularly excited about? Uh, well, there was one change. The first, first, complete, completely formal language, in the sense that. Uh, it had a parser, uh, was uh, you know, around the year 2000. And uh, the only change that has been done is that in 2006, when we decided to, to build a theorem prover for it, then I realized that we needed to extend the language uh, in order to be able to write the proofs in TLA plus. Uh, but other than that, the language has been unchanged. What has been changing, proving are the tools. Uh, I should say when I designed TLA plus, uh, I had no tools in mind. Uh, one thing that makes TLA plus different from most languages is that people decide to write a tool and then they build the language around that tool. And TLA plus was not built around any tool, you know, other than you know, making it parsable. And it's not very easy to parse uh, compared to, to other languages. Uh, but you know, I knew it could be done. And uh, then my colleague Yuan Yu decided that uh, you know, it would be nice to build a model checker to be able to check uh, TLA plus descriptions of, of you know descriptions of algorithms, and you know I said, oh, don't do that. TLA plus is you know it's just not practical. It's just you know, too mathematical up to it. And fortunately, he ignored me and he built this model checker, and that was a complete game changer because suddenly. Uh, it provided a tool that engineers could use to check their designs, uh, their high-level designs. And uh, that you know, made an, an enormous difference. Uh, and since then, you know, other tools you know, have been developed. There's the prover, and uh, there was a, uh, an IDE, um, integrated development environment and uh, uh, the, you know, compared to other methods, TLA plus is actually considered to have a pretty good mature tool set. Although uh, I think, you know, compared to things that are uh, you know, built for you know, the average person, you know, things like uh, web browsers and stuff, it's, uh, chewing gum and, and tissue paper. Uh, uh, so TLA plus construction. Sorry. Well, so, and so, uh, you know, and I think there are, you know, exciting things being done about uh, the tool involving the tools, uh, most particularly connecting the, the high level view of the specification of a system uh, to the code and checking that the code actually implements the TLA plus uh, specification of the code. 
but I haven't been involved in, in the actual tool building. Oh, okay, thank you. So TLA Plus has a reputation for being powerful but complex. What advice would you give to someone new to TLA Plus to help them overcome the initial learning curve? I like, actually, I, I can't see the audience, but do the audience think that uh, TLA Plus is complicated or anyone who's used it? I can't tell me if anyone's raising their hands. Uh, no one is raising their yeah. hands. Okay. Well, does anyone think that Java, I mean, I have heard people sort of say that TLA Plus is complicated. Does anyone think that Java is complicated? Mm, no. Uh, I don't see no hands that. raised. <laughs> raise, your hand, raise your hands if you've used Java. Other people have used Java? Uh, How the, the audience? How the audience, more or less? Well, so there, there are some people there who have used Java, but and don't think it's complicated. <laughs> well, if you uh, look on the web, you'll find that there's a book been written giving the semantics of Java, and that's a 381-page book. Now, the semantics of TLA Plus are given in, in my book on TLA Plus in 39 pages. So that's an objective measure that tells you that Java is 10 times more complicated than TLA plus. And actually it's even worse than that because that assumes that the complexity is linear in the length of an explanation of something. And I think it's more likely to be quadratic. So I think in fact, Java is a hundred times more complicated than TLA plus. So, <laughs> Uh, so why is it that people think that, T, that TLA plus is 100 times, which is 100 times simpler than Java, but they, people think T, TLA plus is complicated and Java isn't complicated. And there's a very simple reason for that, is that people have spent a lot of time writing code using programming languages. Uh, so they're very familiar with, you know, with things like Java. And TLA plus isn't complicated, it's math. And math is simple, but people have spent almost no time using math. These you know, people who used you know, programmers and, and most computer scientists. So yeah, they think it's you know, really complicated. And you know, if, uh, if you've never you know, learned arithmetic or you know, done arithmetic, you'd probably think that, you know, boy, arithmetic is an awful lot more complicated than, you know, some nice simple programming language like Java. Uh, so it's a matter of familiarity, not, uh, not complexity. Um, and the way to overcome the initial learning curve is to realize that you've got something to learn. The TLA plus is teaching you something that's really important and useful. And that thing that it's teaching you is math. And what math does is it helps you think about what you're doing. And particularly, it's teaching you to use math to think about the programs that you write. And that's new. It's when new things you know, are not easy to learn. So uh, the advice to you is to, you know, you make up your mind. Are you, do you want to learn something that you know, I say and other people have found to be really useful, but that's not that easy to learn because, you know, it's something that you should have learned in school, but the teaching of math is terrible. Uh, so, uh, you know, not so, so much that the teaching of math itself is terrible, but teaching how to think about things mathematically is terrible. So people learn a bunch of, you know, of mathematics, but they don't learn how to use it. Uh, and so to learn TLA, to learning TLA plus means not only, you know, both learning the math, but even when you've, if you've, 
the, the math isn't that hard. I mean, it's, you know, when I, when I tell people I'm mean, writing a book that says, you know, in order to, to understand TLA plus, you have this really complicated thing to learn. And it's much too complicated for me to try to explain in the book. So I just have to assume that you, that you have to learn this extraordinarily complicated thing. And that extraordinarily complicated thing is arithmetic. All the math that you need, you know, to use TLA plus, it's a lot simpler than arithmetic. Uh, you know, objectively so. I can just, you know, mathematically, it's more complicated than arithmetic. But fortunately, you spent enough time learning arithmetic that you understand it. So I don't have to explain it to you. And therefore, it's, you know, you don't have to go through the years of education that, you know, as a child to learn uh, arithmetic. You've done that, and you can use that ability to learn math. Uh, how easy it is, um, I don't know. Some people have a hard time learning math. Some people don't. Uh, I think it's mainly what happens is that poor teaching of math uh, makes, uh, you know, basically turns a lot of people off and makes, makes them afraid of math. But uh, if you could the ability to learn that math, uh, then it's going to be really useful to you. Uh, and um, I don't know if I should spend the time to explain why learning math is, is so useful. Uh, do you uh, Richo, do you want to uh, me to go into that, or would you like to to move on to other subjects? We should move on, probably. Well, there's a question you later on. There's a question that will allow you to explain it further. So we, I think we, we do it later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, let's let's do it later. Okay. okay. So, before moving on to another topic, continuing with the other class. There are other formal specification languages such as Z or Alloy. So how does TLA plus differ from them? And what unique advantages do you think it brings to the table? Well, uh, well, I can. Sorry, you mentioned Z and Alloy, did you? Yes. Okay. Uh, TLA Plus is actually very similar to, to Z. Uh, and in fact, uh, when I developed TLA, the, the logic, uh, and I wanted to... to uh, get a language, what I thought I could do is, uh, well, I had heard that the people who invented Z understood that Z was not good for dealing with concurrency. And TLA you know, deals with the concurrency. Uh, but so Z is, but Z deals with what we'd call the ordinary math. Uh, in particular, TLA plus has temporal logic in it, and ordinary math doesn't. Uh, and so what I actually had proposed, went to Oxford and proposed to the Z people uh, that um, they could have a new language called TLA-Z or TLZ uh, in which Z would be used to describe the ordinary math, and you know the TLA would be used to describe the concurrency aspects of it. But they weren't interested because uh, Oxford was where Tony Hoare was, and uh, for Tony Hoare, concurrency meant means CSP, and maybe be with that language. Uh, so. They went wanted to develop mine said with TL with uh, CSP, which I believe they have done or anything. At any rate, uh, but uh, Z was a pretty good language, and I 
Uh, but because uh, I, you know, they weren't interested, but uh, there was no need for me to use Zed, and I could correct what I did was and Zed was a pretty good language, but uh, it had some things in it that I think were mistakes, uh, and I was able to fix those and simplify. That's basically simplify uh, Zed, uh, or you know, simplify how the math was pre presented, and so. That's in mean, design TLA plus. Uh, actually, I believe that currently Z has been extended from a little searching on the web. I gather that Z has been extended to uh, deal with safety. Remember, I said there were two classes of properties: safety and liveness. And it's pretty straightforward to uh, to use Z to describe the. Uh, uh, safety and in fact, you don't really need TLA. You don't really need temper logic to uh, to describe safety. It makes it a little bit more elegant. But what you really need temper logic for TLA is for liveness. And uh, you know, I don't believe that uh, they handle liveness uh, with uh, with said still. Uh, Alloy is completely different. Alloy is uh, uh, is purely math, and in a certain way, it's not even designed for really for uh, it's for really des uh, describing mathematical functions essentially, and it's apparently a very good language because. Uh, Pamela Zave was able to use it to actually do some things in concurrency uh, you know, and check them using alloy, even though alloy is not designed for that. And, you know, the, uh, I forget the name of the author of, of, of alloy says that, you know, it was not designed for that purpose. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good language, but it's not designed for concurrency. Uh, and those are, the two languages, two other methods that are really mathematical. Most other specification language, formal specification languages are meant to look like programming languages. And by looking like programming languages, they lose the advantage that one gets from thinking mathematically. So talking about thinking mathematically, in previous interviews, you've mentioned how computer science undergrads shouldn't be afraid of maths. What could be a piece of advice so that they are not afraid anymore? OK. Uh, the very simple study math. Uh, the hard, hard part, part and, and, uh, yeah, I, yeah mean, I mean, the more math, math you learn, 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 the, the, uh, the less, less afraid, afraid you'll be, <laughs> yeah, yeah, assuming, assuming you have these teachers. teachers. I, I suppose, suppose at the level, level you know, university, university level, level mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mathematicians who can teach math, math. math. How, how you, you learn, learn to use, use it uh, with, with uh, uh, no, no. In, in computer, computer science, science programming, programming in particular, particular. Uh, that's, that's a, a that's a tough one. It's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I can, I can, you know, I, 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 you know, no. If I had, if I had to, to do it, it I, would, I would do it. Do it by, 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 teach it. I would, I would teach it by, by you know, just, just using, using a bunch of examples. examples. I've, I've, I've tried, tried to, to illustrate, illustrate it. You know, in the book that I wrote. I don't know how, how successful, successful that was, was. Uh, but, but no, no, I'm, not I'm not a teacher, a teacher. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's not, not my area, area of expertise. Of expertise. <laughs> talking, talking about advice, 
What advice would you give to young researchers or PhD students who aspire to achieve like a significant contribution to computer science? Well, uh, and my advice is don't try to make significant contributions. Uh, you know, do what interests you, do what you find to be fun because you're not going to be good at anything unless you find it, you know, unless it's fun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you never know, you know what's going to be significant. I mean, you know, there are some things, yeah, if you want to go solve, you know, you know is P equal to NP? Uh, well, if that's fun and, uh, you know, you enjoy doing it uh, and you're willing to, uh, to risk uh, not getting anywhere with it and, you know, considering your work to be a failure, uh, then, you know, take the risk. In real life, if you're good, uh, even if you're not good as, you know, and you, and you work on, you know, P versus NP, uh, if you are good, you will, you should discover something that's interesting, you know, worth publishing. Even if you don't solve the complete problem, you may give something, learn something that gives you insight. Uh, but, you know, uh, like this is a in, indicated, uh, you know, my own personal advice is to, you know, what I did is, not to attack a problem unless I thought I, you know, had some way of solving it. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention is that most of the time, the problems that interested me were, they interested me because they seemed to, they, they were reasoning, doing things about the real world. Uh, I've, uh, I mean, my, I've differed from uh, certainly a, a lot of computer scientists. I've seemed to think that uh, that sort of they regard uh, problems in concurrency as you know mathematics, mathematical problems. Uh, I've regarded them more like physical problems or physics problems like the mutual exclusion problem, if you know what that is, you know, it's to write some, uh, an algorithm so that two processes are not uh, uh, both in their critical sections at the same time. Well, not at the same time, that's a physical concept. And these processes, you know, they're not mathematical object, they're programs being written on real machines that, you know, made out of silicon and wires and, and that. And that for me, problems to be interest, interesting is I need to be able to, well, usually I need to be able to relate it to a real problem, you know, not from some philosoph from some mathematical uh, theory about programs, but as, a, but as something that's about, really about real programs. Uh, you know, occasionally, you know, I find some problem that's really a math, math problem and, you know, that seems like fun, interesting, and, uh, you know, I will do it and maybe I'll publish it. You know, it gets to be called computer science, but, uh, it's not uh, most of my uh, my work has where it comes from. Thank you. So we are just doing the last question from our side. Based on your research experience, what guidance would you offer to the students who attended to this summer school? Well, the only advice I can give is to uh, you know, keep learning. Uh, 
you know, you can't know what knowledge is going to turn out to be useful in the future. Uh, you know, I mean, it's whatever interest, interests you. Uh, I mean, if you see, uh, you know, for example, when I started computing, uh, who would think that, uh, you know, psychology would have you know, any uh, relevance to, you know, to computing? But then when people started uh, uh, building, you know, visual interfaces and various things, then suddenly, you know, psychology was important to find out how people actually, you know, learn things and, and you know, the... I think I'm sure that problems being raised by AI, for example, in, in determining, you know, what is uh, what is bias, uh, you know, that involves skills that uh, you know you're not going to be find in in or at least not yet inside of uh, computer science career, uh, uh, programs at, at, at a university. Uh, but, you know, you know, I happen to uh, uh, be interested in physics, so, you know, I learned uh, relativity, and I just had a very, very good understanding of, of special relativity and uh, perhaps the you know my most famous paper and uh, you know was the times clocks paper and that was just uh, a very simple you know I was able to write that and found it very straightforward because of my knowledge of special relativity uh, but I was lucky that I happened to be interested in special relativity and then did it. But you know, there is uh, there's no way of predicting you know what's going to be useful. So learn whatever you find interesting. But well, that, you know you're in a period in your life when you can learn easily and take advantage of it by learning as much as you can. Yeah, I, I think that was the the last of the so-called, you know, uh, prepare set of questions. So before I, I open for the uh, question from the floor, I think it's, it's very good what you say because in essence is what we have been doing over this last several years with this kind of school. So sometimes people say, why don't you make a more topical school focus on just AI or just computer architecture? Well, we have been trying to give you uh, a variety of in general hot issues, because as Leslie say, you don't find everything in the conventional university courses. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Fabrizio. I'm really having that. You know, the audio is not not very good. There's this uh, sort of like sounds like you're talking in a in a in an echo chamber. Could you just start again and and and, and try to be in a soft? You know, speak more slowly. Oh, that might help. Yes. Yeah, I, I was saying that, you know, the, the advice you just gave, uh, you know, is very uh, well suited for what we have been trying to do with this ACM uh, school here in Barcelona for the last five years. Because, in, in, in fact, uh, we often been asked, why don't you do a school on HPC architecture or a school on AI? Why do you somehow uh, you know, give student lecture rather, uh, at the first glance, even uncorrelated. But that goes a little bit along what you were saying. I mean, uh, we uh, expose students to many different subjects. Maybe the only common denominator is that there are, in general, hot subjects. So subjects that you cannot easily get courses in the normal university curricula. And then again, that can inspire 
students who maybe, you know, move their research direction in one direction or another, change their ideas, well, interact with other students and get maybe new ideas. So I think, you know, your, uh, your final comment is extremely well appropriate for the, you know, the, uh, the mission and, uh, you know, the activity of the school of the last five years and you know, moving forward, you know, it's encouraging that we should probably continue on, the, on that path. And now I think it's, it's a good moment, you know, we still have a bit of time. What time it is now? Yes, we still have uh, about 20 minutes uh, for, you know, question from the floor, so yes. Hello. Uh, so I have heard about the vector clock, uh, which it was inspired from the timestamp algorithm of yours. And what inspired you to build the timestamp algorithm and from where did you take the inspiration from? I, I didn't catch all of it. You said, so, what, after you said vector clocks, <laughs> uh, which, which is not, and which is not, anything I did, so. so. Uh, I was uh, asking about f what inspired you uh, for the uh, timestamp algorithm and where did you take the inspiration from? Uh, well, as I said in the time clocks paper, it, it came from special relativity. Uh, well, actually, I mean, the, the reason, well, the, the complete history is that someone sent me a paper Uh, with an al someone sent me a paper with an al was for maintaining consistency in a distributed database, and uh, I realized that their algorithm uh, had the effect of essentially violating causality. That is something that was done. You know that is. Well, the way it could happen is that if uh, you know if you and I were doing some something, you know, and I said I did something, and the accountant you know, talked to you on the phone, and then you said, oh, in that case, you would do something to that account. With that system, the that algorithm, the those two things would have been ordered in the opposite order than they actually occurred. So, uh, and I realized that. The solution to that, it was this, basically the same problem that uh, you know is happens in special relativity because of the fact that uh, you know there is no unique uh, you know two different events in in space time need not be you know there, there may not be a uh, it may not be meaningful to say that one happened before the other. And so, you know, that's enabled me to write the paper. So it didn't take, you know, it's not just a knowledge of special relativity, but also the, you know, getting this paper, uh, which raised the problem that had to be solved and could be solved by special relativity. Uh, so, you know, it takes, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's luck involved. And uh, I used to figure that, I mean, it seemed to me that, you know, I was, well, I, I finally realized that too many of my things that I've done seem to be lucky, you know, just due to luck, that it couldn't have all been due to luck. Uh, so what I think it means is that there are, you know, all things, lots of things around and you need to have both you know the knowledge that it takes but also the ability to recognize that your knowledge can solve a problem okay I thank you That's not for the picture, that's for real. Um, hello, um, I'm Warawan from Thailand. Um, thank you for creating the video um, 
learning course online on TOA Plus. Uh, I really enjoy watching that, including my daughter. She likes you in the cowboy hat. Um, my question was, are you intending to have the more training course online like that for those who are interested to learn different aspects of TOA Plus? And my second question is about the language model. But now, it, now is so many language model appeared, and I think they're struggling on the accuracy. Do you have any comment uh, if TOA Plus could be helpful in that aspect? Well, first of all, uh, I'm not going to make any more videos. Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> there, but I know there is the Plus Cal. Uh, it's not videos, but it's a, a web course for learning plus Cal. Uh, and, you know, I think with the video course and then, you know, using the book, uh, that's should be, uh, you know, I hope that you know, we get you going. And then, now, you said the second thing you said was about language models. And I yeah. didn't. And, and I didn't catch what what do you mean by language models and, and uh, I mean what? the large uh, gener uh, generative AI model that um, if you ask them question they will oh oh, oh they mean the like you know, chat GPT those guys yeah so I mean, so what is the question so now I know what you were talking about what is the question. <laughs> Now the question was, do you think the, the accuracy of such a model could be captured by any formal method um, in mathematics term? Uh, for example, well, can LA Plus be used in that sense? Uh, no. The, uh, uh, well, There are two uh, there are two ways AI could be used. The way I would like it to be used is that one could give the computer a precise high level description of what you want done in something like TLA plus and it would learn to transform it into executable code mm. and you know that would be you know that's the good scenario the bad scenario is that people it will take you know the natural language descriptions that you know, people just give which are imprecise and thought out uh, and then convert it into some kind of code that does something that nobody will really know what it's you know, have no idea what it's actually going to do hmm. and you know i'm afraid that it's the second model that's going to uh, be the more popular one uh, the only realistic hope is that somebody will uh, try to implement the first model as well. Thank you. Hi, thank you. So I was wondering if to you as a mathematician and of course a computer scientist, are there any research topics or problems that are not being perhaps tackled that much right now that you think are really worth being tackled? Uh, I'm just not uh, current enough what's you know, current research uh, 
don't be able to answer that. You know, I'm sure there are lots of problems in AI that uh, that may not be being studied, and I think that a lot of uh, work. I suspect that well, there's a lot that can be done, but uh, you know, it's not going to be easy. Uh, and uh, but you no, know, I can't. And have no particular uh, idea of what that could be. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we'll save time for another couple of questions, and we will need to bring the section to a closure. Um, good morning. Leslie, it's a pleasure. Um, I have a question, very simple um, for you. I, I know maybe we can remember these words uh, in the future. Uh, how far will, will we go all this uh, um, community and also HPC in the future? What will be, um, I mean, the, the technology here in 100 years? Will they replace us? What do you think about it? Well, uh, my general answer to questions like that is that uh, I'm no better at predicting the future than anyone else. Uh, the only difference being is that I uh, am aware of that and therefore do not try. <laughs> okay, time for uh, the last question. Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, hello. Um, I don't know too much about TLA Plus, but when you were explaining the difference of why it would be easier to, or why it's hard to learn TLA versus Java, you were saying it's because TLA is math and we're not as familiar with learning math and that some of the um, kind of mathy programming languages that become more like programming languages, then they lose kind of their mathematical expression, which is powerful. And I've heard something similar said about functional languages like um, Haskell or Lisp and this idea that people struggle to learn functional languages over imperative languages because they are more like mathy. And I just wondered if you had any opinion on, you know, the kind of C, C++ Java imperative language style versus functional languages like Haskell or Lisp or if you have opinions on, on this. Okay, well, uh, um, functional languages, uh, first of all, you know, people that I respect, you know, I've never, uh, I guess the only functional language I think I've programmed with what's considered a functional language I programmed in is Lisp. Uh, and uh, the uh, I designed a functional language once, but uh, <laughs> it's something else. Uh, is do you but, do you have it? Did you like release well, it uh, to it, the world? Yeah, well, uh, no. It's uh, there's BibTeX, which is used LaTeX. You know that that's for creating bibliographies, and uh, that you program the document styles the way the bibliography information is converted into uh, LaTeX uh, using a little programming language that I wrote and happens to be a functional language. Uh, and, you know, functional languages, you know, are, seem like a very, you know, good idea if you're computing a function. Uh, the, the problem is, thing is that I'm interested in concurrency and most concurrent programs are not compute a function. They, uh, you know, what they do is they interact with, uh, you know, with each other and, you know, with the environment. And what you're specifying is not a function, but an, a continuous interaction. And, uh, you know, now 
people uh, have used functional programming languages to write concurrent programs. And, but, you know, what they do is, uh, uh, Include it in some way, you know. They they just add some hack, some non-functional aspect of it. Actually, it reminds me. I was once teaching a, uh, you know, I was actually learning Prolog with. Uh, I love Prolog. Uh, well, I, yeah, I was. Uh, well, I had it was Turbo Prolog that was decades ago, and I was decided to learn it, and you know, with this child, and I was you know, teaching the child, uh, and when we got to this, you know. Along and then we came to the write function w r i t e, and this child turned to me and said he had it was about thirteen or something, uh, and he had learned functions in, in school. He turned to me and said, "Write is not a function," <laughs> and uh, you know he was I realized he was perfectly correct. You know it was like you know. The emperor has no clothes. <laughs> you know, if you have a PhD in, in, uh, in haute couture, you can probably define clothing in such a way that, the, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the king is perfectly clothed, but you can't fool a child. You know, the emperor has no clothes and right is not a function. It's something you kludge into a, a functional language in order to get some output. And then it's the same way with... Uh, you know how functional languages are used in. Uh, I, I presume, and you know, functional languages are used in uh, concurrent uh, in concurrent programming. Uh, and you know, I know that uh, Lisp. Uh, you know, there was pure Lisp, and then there was Lisp that you could you know write use as a as a real programming language. That I forget what it was called, but you know, give it a series of commands, uh, and. Uh, the uh, you know which you would need to use to use that if you were going to use you know do write concurrent programs in Lisp. Uh, so uh, you know functional programming languages, you know they do seem to be really good, and the way they include in uh, you know concurrency that might be good too. You know I'm not an expert on coding. Uh, I've uh, I think I've actually written one piece of concurrent code in my life uh, that was done in Modula 2 Plus. Uh, uh, you know, that a real program that, that people used. But, uh, you know, attempts to treat concurrency as a functional issue are, you know, the ones I've seen just make no sense. Uh, it's not the right way to think concurrent interaction, you know, as in terms of functions. Thank you. I mean, functions, of course, are very important things. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're I, mean, I write functions all the time in part of TLA plus specifications, but that's because TLA plus is math. And one way of writing math is, uh, you know, you use functions, but the actual specification of a system is not a function. You so, trying so, to do that is a, it, that, that's 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 a losing way. <laughs> that's just so, a bad way of thinking about it. Are you sort of saying that functions are a part of math, but math is bigger than just functions? Well, no, I'm saying functions are part of math, but but you know when you, that, but you use math to describe some and to say that, that to try to describe a concurrent system as a function is not the right way to do it. You know, I do it as a temporal logic formula. And that that works great for, you know, the particular way things I want, I use that description for. And that is for reasoning about what's called correctness. But what that means is that a correctness property is one that is true or false of a single execution. And with that, you know, with that definition of correctness, TLA plus is, you know, I believe the best way, you know, I know of for reasoning about, you know, the way to, to think about uh, programs. Uh, 
for uh, reasoning about the correctness of the program. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was exciting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you for the very nice uh, uh, insights. Uh, I would move away from technical questions and just ask for a piece of advice, I guess. Uh, so have you, come, have you ever been at a place where you feel like the problem you are tra tackling is not really interesting to you anymore? And what's your typical advice in such situations? Uh, well, fortunately, you know, it's been many, it's been quite a few years since I was in that a position like that. But, you know, when I started out, and certainly, you know, when I was your age, uh, I was doing things that people told me to do, uh, and uh, not, uh, not of my own choosing. But what I have found is that If you that's a great way of putting it, I've, what, I, what I have found is that you know I've had to do something, brother, and you know when I started working on it, I discovered that you know there is really something interesting in here, and maybe it's you know this thing that I wanted um, you know have to do is really part of a you know some larger class of things, and maybe I could, you know, find some solution to that larger class or, or, or something like that. But I would quite often find a way to find something interested and worthwhile uh, and something I could learn by doing that task. Not always the case, but sometimes it, it will happen and you have to be, should be, uh, conscious of the possibility and you should be looking for things like that and you know, looking for things in it rather than uh, just feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> okay, I think Thank that you. is that is a very constructive and, uh, and useful uh, advice to all of our students. So Leslie, uh, it was great to have you once more. Uh, maybe next time you will, we will have you in presence. I think I will see you soon in Adelberg. So, yeah. well, thanks a lot again. And, uh, well, let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. I hope there's applause because I can't hear it. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, <laughs> Leslie. Bye, everyone. Yeah, bye. bye.